Now that scene took place at the end of The Wizard of Oz. Remember that? She's there clicking. I, I forgot my slippers this morning. I can moonwalk. Like, um, <laughs> good morning. How are you guys? So glad you're here. Beautiful day. Happy anniversary, Bob and Jane Rundle, yesterday. Bob, you're more my hero today than ever because anyone who can put up with Pastor Jane for 50 years, whoo! Look at her. She's got that look like, oh, I am gonna so pay for that. <laughs> just so, so just wanted to honor, though, like, wow, 50 years. Like, that's just amazing. Um, thank you for doing that. Thank you for persevering through everything internal and everything external that would want to come against a covenant relationship like that. That's beautiful. Beautiful to see. So thank you. And uh, hey, and wow, we, um, Curtis and Debbie had um, a beautiful baby boy by the name of Leo. So we welcome him. And uh, Jackie and Eric, um, they had um, Quincy, and uh, just, um, just beautiful, another ba beautiful baby. And uh, Sarah, she's walking in just now. So everybody, wave Sarah. And everybody. Um, um, her sister Sharon just had a, a, a beautiful baby. They had all these babies just popping all over the place. Now Sarah has decided to change her work schedule because of the baby, so she goes early to hold the baby, and she comes home late because she wanted to hold the baby as well. So um, that's good. That's always good news, always good news. We just want to celebrate, celebrate all of those amazing victories. I am... Um, Dorothy, she clicks her heels at the end to go back to the thing that she wanted to leave. There's no place like home. I'd like to propose to you that everything that you're looking for is actually not found in the Emerald City. Does, doesn't, isn't it always greener on the other side? Um, I've heard people say, the grass is so much greener in my neighbor's yard. I said, that's what I was gonna say, like, just, dude, fix your lawn. Because over there, you're gonna have to fix that lawn too or it won't be green anymore. And once you get on that lawn, you're messing it up, you know? But the beauty about this is, the contrast is, we can be looking for other things in other places. We can be looking for all of our dreams, all of our expectations. We can be looking for all of the beautiful things, the things that can be so alluring and so drawing, and we know that if we can get to that place, that we'll then be really happy. But the reality is, is that everything that we're really looking for is found in that which he has already placed us in, which is our home. And the beauty about the home versus an Emerald City is, the home has the ability to crush that was trying to destroy you, that without the home, you don't have the ability to have it crushed. I think the beautiful, the, the most challenging thing that we have in our society today is not opiates. It's not suicide. It's not marriages falling apart. It's not, um, it's not, um, it, it's, it's the lack of community. It's the lack of home. It's the lack of family. It's the lack of focus. It's the lack of, see, all of the things that, that he, see, because it's God the Father, it's not God the king, not God the judge, not God the, now he is those things, but he relates to us as God the Father, and he adores us, and he loves us, and he's passionate for us, and it's in that context of home. We have God the Son, which is Jesus Christ, and we have Holy Spirit who nurtures us like a mom, and what the world is lacking and in what the world is lacking, they're looking for it in things that become addictive to them or drawing to them, whether it be pornography, whether it be drugs, whether it be power, whether it be money, whatever those things are, other relationships, we're trying to fill a tank, we're trying to fill a void that only the family context has the ability to fill. Everybody's looking for a home. Everyone's on a journey. I just want to be in a place that I am accepted. I just want to be in a place that I'm loved. I just want to be in a context where I'm not going to be thrown away because of my behaviors or my mistakes, but I actually can be in a context where I can discover who I am and other people see who I am so that actually I can become all that I am and actually act in the way that I've been designed 
to be. That's in a place of safety. That's in a place of acceptance. That's in a place of welcoming. We learned last week that, that uh, love always begins with this thing, and the foundation of it is unconditional acceptance. But the beauty about love, what we learned last week, was that love doesn't leave us the way it found us. Love actually has an intention to take us to a place of our purpose, destiny, that can only be found and can only be discovered in the context of safety, in the context of family, in the context of home. You can be hearing things from God, you can be getting direction from God, but you will discover that community or family is the place in which you get ascending of God into your next purpose, destiny, that is safe, that is covered, that is protected, because you're not going by yourself, you're going as a part of the family. Your kids can go to college or they can go get a job or you can send them off to college and send them, send them into their purpose destiny and a, and, and a family that sends, the person actually is the beneficiary of a family that sends rather than going on your own. You can do it on your own for a while, but you're not meant to. None of us are meant to do life on our own. And in the context of family, in the context of home, in the context of community, that's where you really find your purpose destiny because you discover who you really are because our identity is established in a relationship with the Father. That's it, we can go home. All right, I'm all done. So, that's the intro. Glad you guys are here, but it kind of sums everything up we're gonna to do today because a lot of places have different purposes and processes, but here's the deal. Today, we're learning how to be loved by God and to love God. When we get together in our connect groups where we go to Journey University, we learn how to love each other and, 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 and to be loved by others. We get empowered by that. But all of that is for the purpose of impacting our world. In other words, when you go to work, you take Jesus with you. When you go to school, you take Jesus with you. When you go in, into a, whatever marketplace you're going into, the world is a better place because you just showed up because of that which you carried, which you actually discovered in his presence, you actually get to take with you into a world that's dying to meet him because you carry him and you represent him so well. Does that make sense? They're looking for a church, a people, a body, a family that actually really knows how to love genuinely and authentically. And everything is contained in this thing called love because God is love. And that's what we talked about last week. Tonight, we have 60 amazing students who are first year, second year, third year students. They're gonna be graduating tonight. And we would love to invite you to be a part of their celebration, to be a part of their graduation um, tonight at six o'clock. And um, why don't you try to, See if you can work it into your schedule and come applaud these amazing world changers. How many know world changers don't happen automatically? How many know world changers happen intentionally? How many know that world changers don't happen overnight? There's no overnight successes in world changers. They actually take a long time. In fact, it may be a lifelong adventure to become a world changer. So come tonight, celebrate with us, love on them, honor them tonight with your presence and with your applause uh, they will be greatly appreciative of that. Next week, we've decided that for once, we're gonna tell you the truth. Usually on Sundays, we tell you the truth, but, you know, so, but next week, we're really gonna tell you the truth. How many really know what the truth is? How many may know what the truth is? How many know that the truth doesn't always the truth? How many know facts are not truth? How many know it's not the facts that set you free, it's the truth that sets you free? So next week, we're gonna talk about the truth. So be here, bring a friend, tell them the truth. They need to be here to hear the truth and invite them and then take them to breakfast and then tip the waitress really well. Yeah. Hey, are you guys open on Sundays? Okay, so don't go to Turtle Leaf Cafe on Sunday, but go on Saturday and Monday. How's that? And tip really well. How's that? That's good. If you miss any of this stuff, go to journey-center.com. If you desire, share it with your friends. Rick does a great job of making sure it's updated and they're always available to you there. Last week we talked about love. This week we're gonna talk about honor. Aaron and Aaron Saray are gone, right? So I can talk about honor. That's their daughter's name, honor. Okay, so. One thing we've discovered, we're discovering, when you talk about love, love isn't just something that you talk about. Love is something that you are. Love is something that you do. 
Love is a verb. It requires action. And love has the ability to do things that nothing else can. In fact, there's no other term to describe God outside of love, except for there's some characteristics, there's some mannerisms that he has. But when you say God is something, you don't say God is judge. God acts like a judge. You say God has mercy, and he's being merciful, right? He's kind, right? But the only thing that actually contains, can hold the definition of God is love. Think about that. So that means everything in life, everything of questions, everything of wisdom that we need, everything of answers that we need, is contained in this resource of love. Now, Jesus said, I wanna see love come to earth. God said, I wanna see love come to earth. And who did he send? He sent Jesus. Jesus was the explicit image of the Father. And then Jesus left the earth, and when he left the earth, who did he send? Holy Spirit. Where does Holy Spirit reside? If you have accepted Jesus, Holy Spirit resides inside of you. That means within you, within you. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is to come. And the kingdom of God is within. Yes? So that means, if that's true, and I think everything we just mentioned is true, I think it's biblically accurate. If that's true, that means that everything of the kingdom is available, the Bible puts it this way, that the same power that raised Christ from the dead now dwells with inside of you. Is there any obstacle, is there any question, is there any challenge, is there any difficulty that there isn't the wisdom, the resources, the ability to actually answer a question, a problem? Do you think that our world has some problems they need answering? Is it possible that God actually has the answers to those problems? If God is love and God lives inside of us and that same power to raise Christ from the dead is inside of us, then is it possible that we have access to the very same resources that Jesus did? If we do, the only challenge that we have is how do we access it? If it's there, the only challenge we have is how we access it. Jesus, being fully God and fully man, he was on the earth and he had the ability to actually accomplish things fully man because fully man learned how to be fully dependent upon his father, and he was an expression of being fully dependent upon his father, so he was able to accomplish the father's will, because Jesus learned how to only do what his father was doing and only say what his father was saying. So if he learned to do that as a man and grew in favor and stature with God in both places, then so can you and I learn from how he did it, then you and I had the same ability to access the same resources to accomplish the same things. In fact, Jesus put it this way, you'll do greater things because of Holy Spirit living inside of you. That's what we have of the kingdom. That's the resources that we actually have. That's what's available to us from our home that he wants to make his home a dwelling within us here on the earth where we actually can have the same expression of heaven here on earth. That was a lot, wasn't it? Gotta go, woo, but that's true, all right? I should have saved that for next week, because that's true. But, so if that's true, and love looks like something, what does it look like? You will know if you love well, if you honor well. You cannot say that you love God and not love your brother. You cannot say that you're honoring God by dishonoring your brother. Love looks like honor. It actually is the expression of honor. And honor, actually, the reason that honor is so important, and we're gonna learn this today, is that honor has the ability to transform things that love was meant to transform, but love without honor cannot accomplish the truth that's meant to set people free. Does that make sense? There's a way, see, you, you, you begin with love. love. Father, love me, teach me how to love. And then that love comes and you respond to that love. But it's not supposed to just stop there in the vertical. It has to translate into the earth. For me and Lisa, for Lisa and I, to have proper English, for Lisa and I to actually be loved the best is by you guys loving our children. I'd like to propose to you that God is the same way. The best way to love God is how you love his children. The best way to honor God is how you honor his children. You know, it's very difficult to look at a woman in an inappropriate way when you look at her as God's daughter. 
It's very, very difficult. Honor demands an honorable response. Honor demands an honorable eye. Honor demands an honorable action. Honor demands an honorable thought. When you're honoring God, you will honor those that are his. Does that make sense? So love looks like something, and honor has the ability to transform your marriage. It has the ability to transform your work. It has the ability to transform your your city. It has the ability to transform your region. It has the ability to transform your heart. How many know that when you are honored, when you're dishonored, it does something to you? Like, uh uh-oh. How many know when you're disrespectful to somebody and somebody just gives you the utmost respect? It does something to you. How many know when you have the wrong attitude and somebody has the right attitude towards you, you, you you aren't repelled by that, you're challenged by that. When somebody loves you, when you're being unloving, when you're speaking bad about somebody and they compliment you, what does that do to your soul? What does that do to your heart? It adjusts you, it aligns you. But the same is true when you do that for somebody else. The best way to honor somebody and the place where honor is mostly powerful, is the most powerful, is in a place of when you're being dishonored. When somebody is being unkind to you and you honor them. When somebody is in disagreement with you and you honor them. When you don't even believe the way they do and you honor them. Can I tell you the best way to see a Muslim come to the Lord? Honor them. A person, you know, I read this thing um, Tracy Vanderbush put on. She said she used to look at drug addicts as though they were just second-class citizens and that they were just losers and that they were just, you know, they were, just, they were lower class. She really didn't want anything really to do with them. And something happened inside of her. She found they actually were sons and daughters of the Most High God that got lost, that got hurt, that got broken, that got beaten. See, the big deal about honor, honor honor allows you to actually see people for who they really are and to see them with the eyes of the Father. Honor has the ability to transform how you see. It has the ability to transform how you hear. It has the ability to transform what your priorities are. Honor has that ability. You can actually, see, because here's the deal. If we wanna see people come into the truth, then we've gotta lead them into the truth. Wow, what would happen? I'm getting all fired up. I just stood up. I just stinking stood up. What would actually happen if the Democrats honored the Republicans? What would happen if the Republicans actually honored the Democrats? What if President Trump actually got honored right now? I don't care if you agree or disagree. Honor is found the most powerful and potent in in the environment of disagreement. It's when you, you know you're an honorable person when you can honor when you disagree. Honor transforms culture. Honor can transform our country. Now, like love, honor is unconditional. I know we don't like that. Honor and respect is unconditional, like love. The problem is, the the, the reality is, is honor is something that actually frees people and and creates an environment where wisdom, New resources, a new library is actually available to people in the context of honor. Do you know, do you know what I'm saying? Like, when, do you know that when you, when you dishonor people, you put them on defense? When you disrespect people, you put them on defense, right? Not on defense, but you know what I'm saying, on, on defense. If you honor people, you create a safe environment where actually you can begin to have an influence with your voice into their life. When you begin to let people feel safe around you, they'll actually begin to listen to you. Being right is not the goal in relationships. The relationship's the goal. Being right, you know, being accurate and all that stuff, those are all high core values. But if if being right is more important than the person you're trying to be right with, then you're never gonna get anywhere in being right and having them change the way they're thinking. People don't care about what you think until they know that you care about them. That's just the truth. And the way people really feel cared about is how we honor people. Love looks like honor, and honor has the ability to transform people. Dorothy, in The Wizard of Oz, she saw something better. Has anybody ever decided you want a certain car, and then everywhere you look, you see that car? Everywhere you look. I was, you know, I'm not gonna believe this, I was talking to Lisa about a VW Beetle. I I had one in 1970, it was a 72. I didn't have it in 72, because I was only 10 years old then, but but it was a 1972 VW Beetle, and I started saying, I really like to see about having one of those again. 
do you know that everywhere I drove, I see VW Beetles everywhere? And they don't, even, they don't even make them. Like They're like, how am I seeing that? I never see VW, and now I have it in my mind. Can I just tell you something? This is true with regards to honor. If you decide to start finding the golden people, if you have an awakening, if you have a thought, if God puts something on your heart, I'm not gonna think bad about another person. I'm not gonna see another bad thing. You decide something awakens in you that you say, I'm only gonna find the golden people. Guess what? You will always find what you're looking for. If you're looking for reasons to do something, you will find them. If you're looking for excuses to justify how you're acting, you will find them. But if you're actually looking for genuine, authentic gold and purity in people, guess what? There's a lot of good in a lot of people because there's a lot of God in a lot of people and they haven't discovered that God yet, but they're looking for the church to actually discover it first and lead them to it. Because the church should be leading people into being gold diggers. But the right kind. I lost something. Oh, there it is. Jesus' attitude towards the Pharisees is not his attitude towards humanity. You know what I love? I love you. But you know what I love besides that? I love God. Okay, but besides that. I love Brendan, but besides that. I love my wife. But besides that. I love, I don't love. I don't love. I don't love how I will look at scripture to find a reason to justify my inaccurate behavior. Anybody do that? Ever, anybody ever read scripture to go, ha, I knew I was right. <laughs> I found one reason right there. Look, see Jesus, look how Je he, he went in. I can justify my anger because Jesus went in and tipped over all the tables. I can just see, I did. And, then, and see what we do is, we do this about Jesus too. We do, we do this about uh, Jesus. How many know that Jesus was called the great physician or the great healer? Yeah, but we'll look in scripture to find places where Jesus didn't heal and we'll say, see, I told you. He doesn't want to heal all the time. How many know that Jesus actually wants to see everyone go to heaven? How many know that not everybody is? Was that his will or ours? Was that his choice or ours? I'd like to propose to you that his will will not trump our will until our will comes into align with his will, that actually his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. But we've got to decide that. But his will is that we're healed. His will is that every marriage survives and thrives. His will is, is that you, 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 you are a, live an abundant, joyful, peaceful life. A life and a life more abundantly. That's his will. So how do we get it? How do we go after it? How do we establish it? How do we desire it? And that's why we have scripture to show us what Jesus did. When you read the gospels, he gives you great ways to actually accomplish. But all through the New Testament, people learned actually how to do what Jesus did, and they didn't just do it by what they heard, they did it by action. And then they found the benefit of it. So, if you have an attitude that should only be for the Pharisees, keep it for the Pharisees, not for humanity. Pharisees are people who don't think they needed him, they don't think they can be taught, they don't think they have, they've got it all figured out, and Jesus said, you actually don't, you actually do need me. Yeah, okay. There's this lazy theology out there. How many wanna be strong in your theology? Here's a way, all right? Understand this, understand this. Not everything that happens is God's will. Lazy theology says, oh, well, it happened, it must have been God's will. Can I tell you there are a lot of things happening in the earth that is not God's will? Stop blaming God for what, the, what Satan is stealing from you. A loss of a baby is not God's will. A loss of a marriage is not God's will. It's not. The enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. But he has come to give you life and have it more abundantly. Let's get our theology correct. And here's the deal. When you're being stolen from, Stop the access. Start making declarations. Start understanding what you actually have as a promise. Start understanding that, you know what? 
I'm not gonna let the enemy steal from me anymore. I'm not gonna let the enemy have access to me anymore. I'm not gonna let the enemy challenge, go in and, and change the, even my theology because I've had bad experiences here or bad experiences there. I am sorry for you being abused. I'm sorry for you having bad life experiences, but bad experiences and, and, and hurts and pain and abuses are not his will for your life. In fact, he says this that whatever the devil has come to try to cause a hurt in your life or a destruction in your life, he has an intention to take even the worst case scenario things and actually turn it into something good. Because all good things come from the Father of lights. That means no bad things come from him. Does that make sense? So, let's get our theology right, and then I'd like to just do this real quick this morning if I can. I'd like to, out of this book called uh, Keep Your Love On, on page 65 in your hymnal, if you'd like to turn there. <laughs> oh, we don't have hymnals, but not the hymnals are bad. We just like hernals better. Wow. So page 65, it defines love. A pillar of love is comprised of commitment, action, and result. The commitment part is this. I care about you and I value you, all of you. I care about your soul, I care about your spirit, I care about your body, relationships, dreams, and your destiny. The action part is demonstrating care and value in many ways and in many situations as you get to know a person over time. And the result of these actions is that the person actually feels loved, they feel safe, they feel valued, they feel connected to you, nourished, protected, and they feel understood. See, love has to look like something. You can't just say, I love you. The people that you say you love actually should know it. They should feel it because you're demonstrating it. Because there's an action. There's actually, it's, 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 it's spoken with more than just words. Does that make sense? Pillar of honor, it says this. Honor, like submission, is a term that has been misused and abused, particularly in connection with marriage. People see it as something that is expected rather than something that is given. This is backward. When you honor, when honor is expected or even demanded, it becomes just another word for handing the control, the power, and the value over to one person in that relationship. Listen to this. A relationship where one person has all the power is one of dishonor, not of honor. Relationships are symbiotic. It's give and take. It's honor is something that we give freely. We look out for the needs of each other. We care about each other so deeply and we actually make sure that each other's needs are being met instead of trying to just meet our needs. That's what true relationship is. Who, who, who would love to benefit from the rest of the story? So only two people out of this whole house need this thing. That's unbelievable right now. I actually, sorry, I got, it's not, everybody, listen, you're all valuable, but I just, you've been really highlighted to me. So, so I'm gonna embarrass you for a minute, if that's all right, and just come back here. But um, Father, I just pray right now that uh, this would bring life, hope, correction, direction, and peace, um, that Father, there'd just be such, such life that this would be a draw to a world that's desperately, needing to be able to be loved appropriately. In Jesus' name, I bless you. I bless you. Now, for the rest of you, they are available in our bookstore, and um, if you can't afford to buy one, I'll buy you one. How's that? Is that fair? There better not be 300 people go to that bookstore. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Jesus put it this way, through the Apostle Paul through Holy Spirit. Book of First Peter, for it is God's will. Who would like to know what God's will is? Okay, for those of you that would like to know, I think we all do, or we wouldn't be sitting here today. And thank you for sitting here today, because you guys actually are the ones who are gonna change the world, because you're willing to take the time to learn and to hear his heart, so you can actually display his heart to a world that's desperately waiting to see his heart. 
His will is this, that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. <laughs> I so love this passage. I love to see ignorant people shut up. And I've tried a lot of ways to make ignorant people. How many know that, how many know, how many know some ignorant people in your life? Wow, how many are ignorant people in your life? <laughs> it's like, it's like, but what's the best way to make them shut up? Do you ever, I'm not a police officer, but I pretend like I am when I wear my state trooper shirt. My son gave it to me and everybody, are you a state trooper? I say, I'm retired. <laughs> no, no, I don't, no, I don't. But I could say I was retired, if I was retired, but I'm not retired, but I would, I've actually thought, you know, when I get to re-retirement and I'm gonna wear that shirt and they ask me if I'm a state trooper, I'm just gonna say I'm retired because that's the truth then. I did retire as a state trooper. Okay, never mind. But anyways, so as a state trooper, I wear that shirt. I wear that shirt. Truth is, ne truth is next week. Truth is next week. So if you want to hear the truth, come next week. Um, <laughs> but, but when I wear that state trooper shirt, you know, um, and, and I come up to somebody. Now, I, there's, there's two options that you have when you're carrying some type of authority. It's an authority that you have to voice or it's an authority that you have to display. Has anybody ever watched Tombstone, the movie Tombstone? I, I, it's a great movie, you gotta watch it. I've watched it like 30 times. I always invite Sheriff Rucker over when we watch it because you know, he ain't no Huckleberry at all, he's a daisy. You know? So anyway, so that's a whole thing. <laughs> that's a, but, but one thing that's, that's great um, about a, a person who actually carries authority is they don't have to talk about it. So a person who carries authority, why, why, I, I love, I love um, Doc Holliday. Doc Holliday, this guy's like, he's gonna challenge him to a gunfight, and Doc Holliday just goes like this. That's just my game but it wasn't the words, it was the look. I love when um, Wyatt Earp, um, with this, with this, this guy's going, this guy's going, I'll blow your head off, and Wyatt Earp looks at him, and he, just, he, he puts his gun up, and he looks at him in the eyes, he doesn't say anything, and they go, oh, he's just bluffing, he ain't gonna shoot you, and, 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 and the guy goes, oh, yes, he will, oh, yes, he will, like it's seeing in his eyes. See, I think there's something about the church that we've gotta get it back in our eyes. I think there's something about the church that we don't have to be about the talk anymore. I think we walk into a situation and the situation changes because we just, we have our robes of righteousness on, we're carrying a presence that you walk into the room and everything in that room has to change because of what you're carrying. And I'm gonna tell you right now that Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday in their own way and the officer, when you're moving in honor, you're moving in authority. That is just the truth. When you're moving in honor, you're moving in authority. The weapons of warfare are different. They're not carnal like we see in the world. When you, when you are honorable to people, you get a voice to people. You can look them in the eyes. And I'm gonna tell you something about honor. Honor isn't just saying somebody's amazing. Honor is challenging that person and saying, this is not who you are. Yes. So stop acting like that. Come up to who you actually are. And you don't have to raise your voice to do that. You can raise that with the authority that is in your voice. Because you'll speak from a place of love and of honor, and you don't leave them where you found them, you take them to a higher place. That's the intent of honor. That's the intent of grace. Grace isn't to empower you to sin, it's to empower you to not have to. Yeah? Okay, so, foolish people. <laughs> well, have you ever noticed that ignorant people are the loudest? <laughs> you pull them over, what do you mean? I wasn't speeding. How many have ever been pulled over by a police officer and when you've dishonored them, you didn't get a ticket? <laughs> I have found that, I've, I've been pulled over before I had my state trooper sticker. I, I've been pulled over. <laughs> now I've been pulled over a lot with my state trooper sticker, but it, it's worked. Anyways, anyway, don't tell me, shh. But anyways, but with that, with that, Wow, I'm really throwing myself under the bus here. Um, but with, with that, when you, I have found great favor when I've been honorable. A police officer, did you, did you, see my dad, my dad, I gotta tell you a story about my dad. My dad would get pulled over and the police officer would say, did you have your seatbelt on? And my dad said, I don't know, did I? That was my dad, he was my teacher, so I've had to learn to I've changed a few things. So now what, I, what I've learned is this, integrity, honesty, you know, you may pay a price, 
but it is always a better consequence in integrity and honesty than it is in lying. Does that make sense? You can try to think you can get around and get over. I wanna tell you something. Uh, authorities have this uncanny ability to know when you're trying to get over on them. It's, an, it's something, not just in their training, but it's something innate. God's placed everybody in authority so that he's also gifted them to be in authority. So I mean, you're not gonna skate. You're not gonna get around them. And so I wanna just say, I, just, I, I have found that there's been times when I've been pulled over by a police officer or whatever it is, and you, hey, you were speeding, you know, did you know that you're doing 72? I'll say, well, actually, I think I was doing 75. I've had people say to me, you know, you shouldn't be a pastor because of this, 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 and this. I go, that's nothing. Let me tell you some things, some real reasons why I shouldn't be a pastor. <laughs> but what does that do? Well, what does that do? Listen, can I just tell you something? There ain't none of us that qualify for, to be anything. Everything, any qualifying that we have is all because of him. There's nothing we've earned. There's nothing we've accomplished. There's nothing that's been because we've been so good. It's all been by his grace. But what I've learned in his grace is that I get to do things right, that I don't have to do things wrong anymore. That's the beauty of his grace. <laughs> I don't, man, if you, live, if you live by the praise of men, you'll die by their criticism. It's just true. So, Jesus said, live as free people. Don't, don't use your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but live as God's bond servants. Live as God's slaves, because actually, we, we as slaves should actually love and honor as though we were free, because we actually are, because when we were as slaves to bondage to sin and death, we couldn't even live as free men, but now that we are free men and we are free women, we actually should love and honor people in the way that as a bond servant of Jesus Christ, that it's appropriate and demonstrating, because you and I today we get to choose not to sin anymore because we've been set free from it. Before we were set free, we didn't have any choice. We had to live in sin. We don't have to anymore. That's why we have grace. It's so amazing. I get to be who I really am. I'm a king. I'm a priest. I'm a son. I'm a daughter of God. Yeah. And so are you. He says, show proper honor. Show proper respect to those that you like. Show honor, show proper respect to those that agree with you. Those are in the same party with you. Those that um, you know, um, you know, are your homies. No, it says everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the president. That's the Holy Spirit saying. I don't, I, don't, I don't agree with him. It doesn't matter if you agree with him. He's not asking you to agree with him. He's asking you to honor him. Ooh, I don't care if that's Democrat or Republican. It's like, or whatever the, every leader that's been placed there has been placed, but honor is the thing that actually transforms people. You wanna see President Trump change? Honor him. If you wanted to see President Obama change, honor him. It's true. You wanna see me changed? Fire me. <laughs> honor, honor is an amazing thing. Wanna see your kids change? Honor them. Want to see your husband change? Honor him. Want to see your wife change? Honor her. Her. Honor her. Honor her. You are free, but not just to do what you want. You're free to do what is right. You get to do what's right now. Relationships between these three or five, five things. Everything begins with love in the kingdom. And out of love, it get, when you are walking in love, when you're moving in love, you're able to see the truth in people. When you're able to see the truth in people, then in love you can speak the truth to people about who they are, hold them accountable to their identity, and watch them come into freedom. Once they come into freedom, they get to begin to experience God's grace. And once they begin to experience God's grace, that fuel of God's grace, then, then they'll be able to be propelled by honor and become honorable people. Do you wanna see your kids set free? Then learn how to love them, be truthful with them, set them free, have them learn how to operate in grace so that they can be honorable people. That's how it happens. But it begins with love and it's demonstrated by honor. They will know that you love them when they're honored, where they're at, where they came to you at. Does that make sense? So, there's this tension though that we have to learn to live in. You and I have to learn in, live in. Because we are at liberty. But he says don't use your freedom as a reason to just do whatever you want. You've gotta learn actually to live in liberty as a bond servant, and when you learn to live as a bond servant, a, willingly, a willing, willing servant of Jesus Christ, that's the freest place you can actually have in your life. Do you wanna know how not to fall off a cliff? Talking about grace and talking about, you guys wanna know how to not fall off a cliff? 
Can I give you an example? Ready? Don't get too close to the edge. I have lived 54 years and never fallen off a cliff. Do you know why I've never fallen off a cliff? Because I didn't get too close to the edge. Here's what we do with grace. Here's what we do in our society. I want to see how close I can get to the edge. I want to see how close I can get to fooling around. I can see how close I can get to lying. See how close I can get to being inappropriate. See how close I can get to sin without actually falling off or dealing with the consequences of sin. Grace is something that actually creates a buffer that says, hey, no, 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 no. I, I, anybody watch movies where you, somebody's like getting ready to jump and they show the film? Like I go, oh, oh, I, like just watching the movie, I get like all stressed out just watching the movie because I, like, I don't want to get that close to that thing. I don't want to get that height. So I don't, I don't want to fall down. I've learned, I've learned, and, you, and we need to learn that grace is actually the thing that keeps us away from the edge. It doesn't, it do, grace isn't for the purpose of getting as close to the edge as we possibly can. Does that, does that make sense? So, don't get too close. This charge, he says, that I commit to you, son Timothy, there's a charge that here in, in the book of Timothy that Paul says, I commit this to you, Timothy, this is worthwhile to commit to you, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them, you may wage a good war, having faith and a good conscience. How many know we're at war? Your family, you're fighting for your family, you're fighting for your children. Are we fighting anything in our culture right now? Is there something in the city of Elmira that we're fighting? Is there something in Horseheads that we're fighting? Is there something in New York State? Is there something in our nation that we're fighting right now? There's a war that's taking place that he says you can learn actually to fight a good war. You can war well. And if you're gonna war, you can war or you can war well. You can do, be engaged in a good warfare. Does that make sense? Anybody prefer the good warfare? All right, so here's how you do it. And there's something amazing about having a good conscience because of this. A good conscience is actually the context, the environment in which a good war can be fought. You cannot displace evil with evil. You cannot displace darkness with darkness. And you will always fight as a kingdom person, as a believer, you will always fight as strong as you are pure in your conscience. Jesus said it this way, guys. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. Why? Both (laughs) allow your conscience to be pure. Cannot afford, you and I cannot afford to have anything in us that the devil can use against us. Because anything that the devil discovers in your life, if there's something in you, he will exploit it. If there's something in you, if there's a place of darkness in your life, can I tell you something? He has a right to you because the enemy has a right to darkness. He has a right to darkness. He can squat in a place of darkness. But light displaces darkness. And a pure heart, and a find, find in me, discover in me, God created in me a clean heart. Give me clean hands. Can I pray this over you right now? God, that we'd have clean hearts, we'd have pure hands before you, God, that we actually would be powerful in our warfare, that we would actually be influential in our warfare, that we actually would do good warfare, that we actually would be effective in our prayers because we come from a place of having a good conscience before you. Can I tell you something else that he said in that scripture? Don't go to war until you get a word from God. Why are you fighting all these battles you don't need to be fighting? Fight the battle that he has placed in front of you and has equipped you to win. God will never call you into a battle that, he doesn't, that you're first not prepared to win with him. Whatever those strongholds are, whatever those difficult, can I, can I tell you something? Do you guys believe that God actually has the answers to our opiate issue in this city? See, I want to know the recipe for success for our city. The reason is I care about our city, but I care about our culture. I care about this generation. I care about our country. But if we can get the answer 
to our city, then we can transform not just our city, we can transform culture because if one city falls to his righteousness and his glory, then every, every city can fall to his glory. But it begins with us, it begins right here, it begins with our heart, it begins with our conscience. Get a word, it allows you to change your thought about people, about God, about, about our culture. Then we stand in a promise, what is God's promises for us? And then he becomes that great yes to us, and we go, you are our yes. I don't need these other things, I don't need to say no to all these other things, because you are our yes. And we begin to say, so be it in me. And we discover our identity in the process because we've discovered our Father. The more that you discover Him, the more you'll discover you. This whole world is waiting to discover who they are, but it's found in the context of family. It's found in the context of the Father. It's found in the context of being loved, adored by your dad. Then you can have your purpose. Then you can make wise choices. And then we'll see breakthrough come to our city. This is how heaven and earth collide. Jesus is, is our divine yes. You're my yes, I don't need anything else. Seek first your kingdom, seek first your righteousness, and then all these other things, they're gonna be taken care of, they're gonna be added, but they're not first. These other things are not first, you're first. And all I have to do is say, so be it. You be my yes, God. You be my yes, Jesus. You be my yes, Holy Spirit, first and foremost. I care about these other things, but I know these other things will be cared for best by the yes that I have in you. Having faith in a good conscience with some having rejected concerning the faith and suffered shipwreck. Therefore I exhort you, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving thanks be made for all men, for all people, really? Supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thankful. I'm supposed to be thankful for all people? Seriously? Can I tell you something? It's really tough to honor somebody that you don't, aren't thankful for. And honor is gonna be the thing that transforms them. But it begins by you praying for them in the context of prayer that you're thankful for them. And out of that context of being thankful, you honor them. Because nobody needs false honoring. That's flattery. They need genuine honor that comes from a genuine heart of thankfulness because you spent time interceding, putting supplications that you're praying for them. When you're praying for somebody, they will be honored. It's the natural response. I won't tell you the story. Remember the I Matter kid? I will, I'll tell you one. Remember the I Matter kid? Remember the kid who was pounding on his door saying, come on, old man. And I had my Sequoia and he had his little car, wing, wing, wing. And I got right up on his tail and I'm like, <laughs> I'm taunting him. Remember I confessed that whole deal? Guess who I ran into this week? You should live my life for one day, it is crazy. I was at Express Mart and the kid is standing over there and I'm standing over here. I recognize him because he had his head hanging out the window banging yelling at me. He didn't really recognize me because I was, my, my, my car had all the tinted windows on it. He didn't recognize, I didn't, he didn't recognize my car because my car wasn't right there where he could see it. So he didn't recognize me, but, that, but then he said, hey, aren't you the eye matter guy? Uh, yeah, yes, yes I am. Yes, I'm the eye matter guy. And I think, well, he's recognized me now. And he goes, yeah, man, I, I come to eye matter here. It's the best thing. Thank you so much for doing that for us. And, and, he, and he hugs me. And so I said, I said, I said, do you remember last week we ran into each other? <laughs> and he goes, no, he goes, no, I haven't seen, I haven't seen you since the last time, matter of fact. I was like, I said, I was the guy driving the Sequoia. His face went, whoo! <laughs> Can I just tell you something? If we would honor people because we know who they really are, life would be so much better. I didn't have to have that experience. He didn't have to have that bad experience if we would have actually recognized each other. Honor allows you to recognize people for who they really are, whether they're in the Sequoia or not. <laughs> it's so good. So that's really our template of transformation is this. First, pray for them, all men, giving thanks for all of them. Even the kings and all who are in authority that we may lead quiet and peaceful lives in all godliness and reverence. 
For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved. He desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Three steps this week. Let's practice it. Pray for everyone. In that context, be thankful for everyone. In that context, honor everyone. What would happen if this, this culture experienced honor every day of its life? What if everyone felt honored? What if the drug addicts felt honored? What if the prostitutes felt honored? What if the politicians felt honored? What if the pastors felt honored? We can put us all in the same vein because everyone needs to be honored. Everyone needs to be loved. Everyone needs that which is produced out of a culture of honor. Because this is God's will for Elmira, that we would have a quiet life that people wouldn't need drugs anymore in Elmira. That marriages wouldn't be a statistic anymore in Elmira. That kids wouldn't be abused anymore. We actually have a right as a culture, as a community, to a quiet life. But it begins by praying, by being thankful, and by honor. That's what unlocks this quiet life. He says, you have a quiet life. You'll have a peaceable city. Jobs will thrive. Culture will thrive businesses will thrive in this type of environment where there's honor everywhere. When you go into a meeting that you honor the authorities in that room, when, and in the room, the authorities honor the people that are in that meeting, where honor is happening everywhere in our city, in every relationship, this sets us up for the greatest thing that we've been looking for forever, the greatest revival that can take place, and it can happen in Elmira, and it can happen in our lifetime, because Jesus' will for our city is that everyone should be saved. Everyone should come into a knowledge of Christ. We will not have a problem with drugs if everyone gets saved. Oh, okay, well, forget it. We don't need to worry about that. Let's... Or, here's the option. I'm not going to be sarcastic, but here's the option. We can continue to have our Bible studies in private with no results on the community. And you'll get bigger heads of knowledge. You'll understand some things better. But knowledge without application is toxic. And I think he actually wants to see the nations discipled, not just individuals. And, disciple, and nations get discipled by a culture discipling a culture. And guess what, guys? Our culture's changing. Guess what, guys? This culture's gonna change or we won't have evidence that our culture has changed because the evidence of our culture change is that culture changes. Does that make sense? Because this great good news is not just for us. It's for everyone. And we're not gonna have any more orphans and we're not gonna have any more foster kids and we're not gonna have... Any... Listen, the hospitals can become great apartment buildings. Stand with me. Let's worship one more time. I love you guys. Have a great, great, great day. Thank you for listening.